our society has within its makeup. Too many who live with what is called Peter Pan Syndrome. The name itself, I think, should be self-explanatory. But let me take a moment and flesh out for us what this terminology actually means. Peter Pan Syndrome is a nice and succinct way to basically say that that particular individual won't grow up. Some of the characteristics include they are irresponsible. Either they won't work, or if they do hold a job, they don't work hard. This type of individual will not take time to develop lasting relationships. They flow from person to person, and it may be from uh, a significant other to a significant other, but it is usually filled, these relationships, with superficial living, possibly in often living together in casual sex. Which, by the way, there is no such thing as casual sex. That is a worldly term, and it is unbiblical and ungodly. This type of person has a lot of dreams. Now, I'm not talking about sleeping dreams, but like, like, like dreams, but they're not goals. They're dreams. So what's, what's the difference? Well, they're what they want, but they're unrealistic. This type of person can be 35, 40, 50, 60 year old and still think they're going to get into the NFL and the NBA. <laughs> Unrealistic dreams. This person is going to be a self-supporting actor. They're going to be a top-selling author. They're going to be the next and greatest Picasso. And the idea in and of itself is not a bad dream to have but they have no goals and they only chase this and when it fails, they don't take responsibility. This person always blames everyone else for their failures. They never own up. Jerry Springfield made a whole career out of people like this. They blame their parents, they blame their teachers, they blame their youth pastor, they blame their spouses, they blame their manager, they blame their employer. They get fired and it's never their fault. It's always, always, always the employer's fault. They cannot hold a job. They, they, they go from one place to another. Well, why did you quit job again? Well, my boss was a jerk. Well, come to bosses. It's kind of like in the, like, the resume, are you a jerk? Yes, be a boss. <laughs> they kind of have to be. Look who they deal with. Consumers. You and me. Who are always angry because it's always their fault. Because in our culture, the customer is always right. Peter Pan said to Wendy in the play, Run away with me. Think of all the joy you'll find when you leave the world behind and you bid your cares goodbye. It's a wonderful, yet unrealistic way of looking at life. It's also the way that children live. But it's not the way that Scripture teaches us to deal with life, is it? Today we come to our sixth core value. At Warsaw Baptist Church, we promote growth in the life of our members. Our text today will be uh, the first psalm, Psalm 1. So please join me in your Bibles there. We promote growth. What does that mean? That means that growth in your life, if you're going to be at Warsaw Baptist Church, is expected. It's not only expected, you're going to get pushed that way. By the way, growing up hurts sometimes. You remember the growing pains? For me, it was ringing in my ear constantly. It was shooting pains all down both legs at any given moment that could actually drop me to the ground. Those, those were my growing pains. As the body develops, each person's a little different. But everyone has growing pains. They may be physical, they may be emotional, 
Most of ours were mental, amen? Two words, junior high. But in our spiritual lives, there's growing pains as well. At Warsaw Baptist Church, it is the desire and goal of those that call this church home that we, individually and corporately, are growing. This idea is core to who we are. It's within our values, it's within our teaching, and it is even spelled out in our mission statement. Warsaw Baptist Church exists to be growing and going in the love of Jesus Christ. Here in the very first psalm, the Holy Spirit describes only two lifestyles. The one who is righteous, the one who is wicked. There is no middle ground. You're either righteous or you're wicked. When a person is actively taking delight in the Lord, in his word, and meditating upon it constantly, it brings change to that soul as he becomes more and more like Jesus Christ. Conversely, those who are not righteous are wicked. I know, big. Write that down. You're not righteous, you're wicked. Those who are not godly are ungodly, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're together on this. We're, we're, we're tracking down this road. It's deep stuff this morning, folks. But there's no such thing as sitting on the fence of indecision spiritually. When someone says, well, I just haven't decided yet, they've made their decision. They're in Satan's family. That doesn't mean that, that we give up. That doesn't mean that they can never come over into God's family. But when someone says, I have not decided what I'm going to do with Jesus Christ, they have decided what they're going to do with Jesus Christ. If, if you don't take my word for it, search the scriptures. Jesus is not going to let them stand before him. And he's not going to be like, have you decided on me yet? No, I'm still kind of working on it. And be like, okay, just wait over there. That's not what the judgment will look like. God doesn't play games with our spiritual lives. We do to our own shame. But he does not. So walk with me for a few minutes this morning down the path of this psalm, Psalm 1, and let's see how God here describes the journey of growth. As we walk through here, would you start by standing with me as I read Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Our God and our family, Father, we are your family. We thank you for this family, the ones that you call your own. And Father, as, as, as your family comes to worship and hear from you, Speak, O oh Lord. Help us hear from you of what you want us to do on this journey in our growth as we take the next steps until the day that we see you. And now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. My God, my strength, my Redeemer. It's in the precious and powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Maybe may be seated. The first step of the journey on this thing that we call life is simply this. You need to choose your path. You ever go, I know some of you have probably never even been in woods before, but if, if you ever go hiking, at some point along the trail, Sometimes many points along the trail. Sometimes the trail itself splits. And sometimes you split off the trail. If you've been um, to 
Highland Lakes. They have some trails down there. And at the men's retreat, uh, Ryan and I took, took a hike. I wanted to show him um, an area that uh, kind of secluded. <laughs> but it is so beautiful. And so we're going down, down the trail. And you can tell no one had been down this trail for, for a while. Why? Because the greatest martial arts instructors had been down that trail. Those are spider webs. You know, as soon as you hit a spider web, everybody's like, whoa! <laughs> okay, so, so we, uh, we decided to, uh, to be a little uh, smarter than the spiders, and so we picked up what, uh, we'll just call them bow staffs. There's your long sticks. Um, and uh, we directed our paths with them. We walked like this. <laughs> we didn't hit any more spider webs. We looked goofy, but it was just us out there. Matter of fact, Ryan is such a smart individual. So I'm walking like this. He was walking like next to me. And he's like, he's right behind me. I look over. I'm talking. He's gone. <laughs> what are you doing? Just following you. <laughs> yeah, you are. Smart man. And we get to this point, and we, we I, I know where we want to go, but there's no trail. So we had to make a choice. Do we go all the way around trying to find a way back there, or do we cut through? Why well, been down that way before? So we cut through, because I knew the right path. I knew how to get there. And when we get, when we got to our destination, it's beautiful. It's great when the leaves are all there. It's awesome when the leaves change colors. We overlooked a valley. And it drops off, and you see a valley just goes off. And when the leaves change colors, everything is bright and beautiful. On our journey of life, we have to choose our path. There's only two. There's the right path and the wrong path. So we just said, talked about making your own path. We got to the destination. We were in no trouble because it was still the right path. The right path can have many different directions to it. But it still ends up in the right place. Let's start by looking at the second half of the psalm and talking first about the wrong path. Look at verse 4. The wicked are not so. They're not at all. If you make notes in your Bible, put this is a total contradiction to the righteous person. It is the total, absolute opposite. It goes through the first three verses and explains what the righteous person does and what the righteous path looks like. And then verse 4 starts off, the wicked are not so. Now, he could have stopped right there, but the Holy Spirit told him to go on. I mean, if this is what the righteous person looks like, the wicked does not look like that at all. But because we have this little thing called an imagination, but most of us have a little thing called imagination, we could have figured out and gone all sorts of direction on what the wicked looked like instead, but God clarified it for us. The wicked are not like the righteous at all. In fact, it says they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. What is chaff? Well, the way it's being used here is when grain is harvested, and especially harvested by hand, it is rolled so that the outer shell and the straw portion are discarded. I was... Uh, I walked outside earlier this week, and remember earlier this week it was very, very windy outside. And uh, sometimes when the wind comes across the fields here and brings the wonderful uh, smells of the farm across the street, it just becomes like a wind tunnel through the, the, the front part of the, the church building. And I don't know why this came to my mind, but I walked out there just to stretch for a moment, the wind's blowing, and the first thing that popped into my mind was, Dad always said, don't spit in the wind. 
For first thing, I mean, how many of your parents told you that, or you heard that, or, 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 you know, I mean, it makes sense, right? I, I don't know why it came to me, but, but I thought to myself, because well, I was studying this, and I was thinking about wind. And a lot of us aren't farmers, but are we together on the picture of that if you spit in the wind? That's just gross. But that's like... The wicked. The wind blows the chaff, the straw. We don't live out in the west. There's no tumbleweeds. When we were living in um, South Bend, we lived on uh, we we're really between two farms. And about 30 feet out of our back door started a field. And when they turned that field, and it was all the dirt in the fall. And then we got one of those wind storms that picked up everything. We would be outside, and, and one of us, and by us, I mean myself or the kids, would see a dark cloud start coming across that field. And we shouted, run. And we ran to the house, and we slammed the door behind us. And that wind was so hard, it took dirt pieces and pelted the back of our house. We were inside the first time this happened. Scared the bejeez out of us. <laughs> All we know is this, 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 this sound is happening on the back door. <laughs> we thought somebody was shooting at us. Like, who is out here? Hunting season hasn't even opened yet. And when it is, it's bow and they can't shoot that fast. You ever take straw and throw it in the air, or grass and throw it in the air, and it just kind of gets driven away? That's what it's talking about. The, the wicked are, are, are tossed to and fro because there's no solidarity to their life. There's no foundation. Remember? Do you remember before you knew Jesus? Do you remember moving here and there and the questions and no foundation? The wicked are like chaff blown away. Verse 5. Therefore, follow the line of thought. If the, if, the, if the wicked are blown all over the place, they will not stand in the judgment. They can't. There's no foundation. Nor will sinners stand in the assembly of the righteous. They cannot be counted with the righteous. God is very, very clear on this. We saw a couple weeks ago Jesus says to these people, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So therefore, he will tell the angels to take them and throw them in the lake of fire reserved for the devil and the demons. They can't stand. They won't be with the righteous. They're on the wrong path. And God knows it. Look at verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You ever meet that person that just, they say all the right things, they do all the right things, everything by outside appearance, they look right. And then tragedy strikes, and their character is revealed. You ever meet these people? God says in the New Testament, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. God is very clear. The wicked will perish they will be thrown away. They will be thrown into the lake of fire. You say, well, that's Old Testament, and you know, God is a God of love, and the New Testament, you know, He's patient and loving. Jesus Christ Himself said these words to probably the, the smartest man in the entire country of Israel. He said, He who believes in Him and the Son is not judged 
Ooh, Jesus using the term judged. Hmm. He who does not believe has already been judged because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God abides on you. God takes this wrong path very seriously. He doesn't want people on it, but it makes it clear we get to choose the path. There is freedom in our choice, and we will, every single time, we will choose what our heart most desires in that moment. Whatever it is, that you desire most, that will be your choice. So there is the wrong path. This is the awesome thing about God. He doesn't stop there. He doesn't even start there. There's another option. We don't have to stay on the wrong path. We don't have to choose the wrong path. We can choose instead of the wrong path, we can choose the righteous path. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. These, these, are, these are some of the stages of growth. You ever watch a baby? They don't walk first. They don't even sit upright very well, especially in a chair. Don't do this, but it's kind of funny. If you sit a baby in a chair, I mean, like, they can't hold themselves up at this point, and then you just watch them go, mm, right? All right, that's where we start, right? Well, that's kind of where we end, too. <laughs> Some of us can't get in the chair without going, uh, anymore. I'm glad my chair in my office has arms, otherwise I think I'd fall off of it some days. <laughs> but these are the stages of growth. What are the, what are the physical stages of growth? Well, the first one, I know this is deep, is birth uh -huh. and infancy. What, what is the cry of the infant? The cry of the infant is simply this, help me. Infants, remember when your kids were infants? Their needs were very great. And when I say kids, it could be your fur kids. Their needs are great. Their hunger is constant. By the way, they get back to that one in the teenage years. Their hunger is constant. Their discernment is non-existent. They, they don't know the difference between a formal occasion or an informal occasion. They don't know if you're at home or if you're at a funeral. When they're hungry, they will tell you. There is no discernment between them. But the infant's potential is nothing short of remarkable. From infancy, we grow into childhood and discovery. And the time frame of childhood and discovery, the catchphrase is, tell me. They're like sponges. Some of you are living that right now. It's like a new world for them every day. And that can either annoy you or you can enter into the wonder with them. They're, they're, the, the growth towards maturity requires our passing through the stage of childhood. In childhood, you have to learn certain truths. The number one certain truth you have to learn in childhood is, I am Dad, you are not. I am mom, you are not. No means no. You will obey me. These are the truths that they need to learn. Why? Because when they start going for the light socket or the stove, they need to understand when you say no, it's for their good. You don't explain to a child when they're sticking their finger towards a light socket, well, there's 110 volts that are going through there. And what's going to happen is the, the, the electricity is going to enter into your finger. It's going to go up your arm. You are a grounded circuit now, so it's going to come through your body. And what's going to happen is it's going to defibrillate your heart. You don't do that to a child. You tell them no. Period. And they will learn about the life socket either by no or personal experience. 
But a child develops certain skills that, that, that during that time help us in life. You know, coloring is one of the most wonderful things a child can do. It helps their imagination grow. It also helps with hand-eye coordination. Refrigerators are full of all sorts of blobs that have no bearing in them whatsoever. But if you ask that child, they can tell you exactly what's in there. Sometimes I think we lose something out of childhood where we can see the unseen. From childhood and discovery, we move into adolescence, and with adolescence comes irresponsibility. The adolescence says, show me. Sometimes disrespectfully, sometimes very respectfully. Adolescent years aren't always terrible. But in adolescent years, there will be terrible moments. Because they're usually old enough to know better, but they deliberately act an attitude and a lifestyle that reflects an unwillingness to grow up. An adolescent is holding on to childhood while trying to live in the adult world. Remember those years? Man, it's aggravating. Don't be too hard on the adolescents. But you need to be firm with them. You need to give them some freedom to grow up. But at the same time, you need to have enough control that when they fall, they don't break. Adjustment and struggles are necessary and present. But in that, it doesn't exclude tremendous growth and the remarkable achievements of adolescence. If you question that, watch the Olympics. Most countries, by the time you're in your early 20s, you're done with your Olympic career. From there, we'll all hang our heads and move into adulthood and maturity. But it's a time of embracing the idea of follow me. Mature adults, notice I said mature adults, there are a lot of adults that are still living in childhood and adolescence. Remember the Peter Pan syndrome? But a mature adult, you understand maturity. You understand that your maturity depends solely upon what you believe, and that belief determines how you behave. One thing that we forget upon the path of the righteous is that growth takes time. So walk with me for the next few minutes through the first three verses, or the next two verses. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. Verse 1 says the blessed man is going to grow up. As he grows, he will delight. To grow spiritually requires two constants. It requires a love of God's law. Call it whatever you want. His ways, his ordinances, his statutes, his word. Do you love God's word? Do you look forward to being in the word of God, or is it a checklist and a burden? Well, Pastor, I don't understand everything in there. That should drive you to love it more, because it tells you two things. It tells you there's room for growth, and it tells you you still need God. Some of us who have been saved for decades understand what it's like not to understand things. Because we read in God's word something, and you, you who have been saved very, 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 you're young in your faith, look at it and go, I don't understand this, and it's a surface thing. And we go, we get that, but this over here, I'm not sure how God does that. We're growing, and we understand that when we don't understand God's word, it does not shake the belief that it's still true. Do you love the word of God? And then it says, in his law, he meditates day and night. Now, a lot, a lot of Baptists have the problem with the word meditate. Let me see if I can be as clear as I can. Get over it. It's in the Bible. It simply means, and I was going to bring a coffee pot out here, but I didn't have time this morning. It simply means to percolate. How many of you drink coffee? No, you don't. That would be absolutely disgusting. What you drink 
is water that has percolated through coffee grounds. Think about that for a second. Do you really drink the coffee? Well, sometimes if it gets into the pot faster, then we drink some of the ground. But, but in, in, in reality, we don't drink coffee. We don't drink tea. We drink the water that pulls something out of it. This is what meditation is. You have the Word of God, and you let your mind go over it and go over it and go over it. By the way, I would read it out loud. And I would spend devotional time separate from meditation time. Meditation time is, is, is not you're going through your devotional time. Meditation time is you take something for a week. I would suggest for a month. Take Psalm 1 and meditate on this for a month. Four days a week, just read this out loud. Read it in different versions. Read it with different inflections at different points in the verses. And watch it come alive. It's percolating. It's thinking through when you think through and then you go through your day and something comes up because, let me tell you, something will come up. You're standing at the path and there is a fork in the road and you've been meditating on Psalm 1 and you go, that's the wrong path. I see that. That's the righteous path. If you've been meditating on the word of God, the choice is very clear and it doesn't take long. You know why we have a problem choosing? Because we don't let the word of God fill us. Amen. It says meditate on it. Let it percolate through you. When? Always. Day and night. When was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night and the first and the reason you woke up is because God's word was saying something to you in the middle of the night? I remember waking up one night and God's word was just going through me, but I knew, I knew I needed sleep. So what I do, I went out, knowing I'd be awake for a while, for a while, I opened up my Bible, and I turned to the best book I knew that could put me to sleep. And so I started reading through Isaiah. And then I got amped up. And I was awake, I was like, oh, holy, 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 this is awesome, this is great. Let's turn to Lamentations. <laughs> need a downer to go to sleep. I wouldn't recommend reading God's word to go to sleep. That was wrong of me at that time. However, you can pull out your life insurance policies and start reading through those. Those will put you to sleep very clearly because you're not supposed to let that percolate through you. You're supposed to meditate on God's word day and night. Look at verse 3. You will be like a tree planted firmly by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. Some of you have, have, have already, you're, you're zoning out on me already because you're focusing on prosper. Stop it. Come back to what we're saying here. Let's start at the top of the verse. The result is maturity. A mature tree is firmly planted. We had a tree up in South Bend that had been cut down. The, in, in, was cut down because it was rotten. And it was a fairly young tree. But just because a tree is rotting does not necessarily mean that you could just take the stump out, right? But three years later, I was messing around with it and I was like, man, I just wish this tree stump would move so I could mow and the whole thing would. It was not firmly planted. If you want to see something really cool, and I was going to bring a picture, but I didn't have time this week, head up to Potona. Bay and go out on the dock. There are some trees that you can see the roots outside of the soil into the water and they spread and they intertwine. And you'll get a good picture of what this is talking about. Firmly planted. What do you plant it in? God's word. What will that look like? Well, a mature tree yields its fruit in season. It yields the fruit in the proper time. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you this. Has somebody spoken into your life and given you the stuff you needed at just the right time you needed it? Has somebody spoken into your life and told you something at the time that it was not necessary or they didn't have the right information and it just was bitter to you? Are we together on the fruit in the right season? 
Just because you have the information, just because you have the ability, just because you have the relationship, unless you have the permission of the Holy Spirit, be quiet. Because the fruit in the right season is when the Holy Spirit comes along and says, hey, they need you. It's the stuff that others need at just the right time. By the way, fruit is never designed for the plant. I have never seen an apple tree go, man, I'm I'm just hungry for an apple. They produce apples so we can have them. The stuff that God's producing in your life is not for you. The testings you're going through, the trials that, that, that go through your life, it's not for you. Well, God's trying to teach me something. Yeah, he's trying to teach you to get out of your box and start living in community with other people. The fruit of the Spirit in your life is not fruit for you. It's fruit for the community of believers. Look what it says. Its leaf does not wither. You know, correct and righteous living never goes out of style. It never goes out of style. A godly person is, is never ever out of style to God's people. Someone that you can look at, it's someone you can admire, it's someone you can imitate. Well, but, but we're only supposed to follow Jesus Christ. Paul said, imitate me the way that I'm imitating Jesus Christ. If you're a mature believer, you better have people following you. Or you're not mature. And then it says, whatever he does, he prospers. What does that mean? Well, that means you're going to get everything you've ever wanted and everything that you ever desired. No, that's not what it means. It means simply this, that your faith walk will be successful. It means that this type of person, when they come and stand before Jesus Christ, here's what they're going to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and turn to the joy of you may be thinking to yourself, how's this all accomplished? Well, it's accomplished through spiritual disciplines in our lives. I've put in the back of the table ideas to help along the journey that you could take on your way out today. Growth is part of the journey. And our life group teachers, our staff, and I pray for your growth. But in order for you to grow spiritually, you must first have been born spiritually. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that one must be born again. This is what we call the moment of salvation. Where you recognize your sin for what it is. What is it? It's an offense to God. And you come to him in repentance, trust, and belief. Repentance, turning away from your sin. Trust that Jesus is God. Believe that he died on the cross to pay Christ for your sins. And then three days later, as we celebrated this morning, he rose from the dead. I urge you that if you've never made the choice of salvation, would you please do that today? We're going to spend a moment in prayer. As you bow your heads and you pray, I encourage you to evaluate where you are in your journey. And I urge you to make a commitment take the next step of your growth today. Our God and our Father, growth is necessary. Sometimes it's really not fun. And Lord, as we desire to grow, would you give us the chance, the opportunity, the courage, and the fortitude step out in faith, to take the next step in our spiritual growth. And as that happens, help us to fully rely on you as our Lord, our Savior, our friend, our Master, our Redeemer, our Provider and Protector. Because this is what you have desired for us. This is what you command us. And so this is what you will enable us to accomplish as you preserve us. 
your truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray.